Well, another good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to today's five a day. We're going to start by giving thanks today, and I'd like to challenge you, encourage you, perhaps is a better word. Right now, think of two things you can give thanks for, and if you're not driving, if you're able, as we saw in, in yesterday's extended version of this broadcast, writing down what we give thanks for gives us that 15 or 20 seconds which allows it to stick like Velcro and not slip off like Teflon. So Father, I want to give thanks and we together want to give thanks. In your hearts and minds, folks, give thanks now. I want to give thanks for all those nurses, doctors, paramedics, support staff who have given themselves sacrificially to nursing our sick and poorly folks. We're grateful. In each country, we're grateful. Father, I want to thank you too that we're moving towards gradual lockdown release in different parts of the world at different rates, but there is that sense of hope and possibility and the rediscovery of what the new normal will look like. In your mercy then we pray, Father, halt this plague from second spikes and second waves and destroy this thing in your mercy we cry out to you now looking up today folks is care workers around the world here in the uk the nhs uh, of course in america italy spain new zealand canada where we have folks listening in watching into these broadcasts but before we start to pray for our care staff, which is a wonderful thing. It's my favorite day of the week, not least because I've got three kids who are in the caring profession. But standing firm today is another scripture from Isaiah or Isaiah, depending which side of the pond you are. But the book is the same. This is Isaiah or Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 11. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. I posted yesterday <laughs> uh, a little article on Facebook about the negativity of the press. Instead of supporting the war, the war effort, they seem to be intent on pulling everybody down. And here in the UK, for example, we had an amazing achievement last week, last Friday, where 120,000 plus tests were done in one day and all the, all the press could do was still criticise. So do not call conspiracy everything these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Don't let the press shape your agenda. And if you are in the press or know anybody in the press, could you encourage them to be positive and join in together to fight this battle and not just be negative? There's a time for appropriate questions, but right now, this is the time to get behind, to encourage and to fight this battle together. Anyway, that's standing firm. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. And the same applies to each of your countries as we come out of lockdown. Don't, don't be afraid of it the new uh, apparent freedoms that we're going to get restored back to us. Don't be afraid of it. Keep your trust. Stand firm. Right. Let's get into prayer for those care workers, shall we? If you're able to stand, why don't you stand? Let's focus together. Father, we're grateful for the care workers in our various countries. Deeply grateful for them. Thank you. Uh, care home workers, emergency services, army workers that are assisting those doing tests. We pray in every country for more than enough PPE. We pray for all the care workers, doctors, nurses, orderlies, administrators, everyone in our hospitals and care home settings. We pray for your encouragement to fill them, your protection to cover them and your power to give them strength to fight this wicked disease. Father, in your mercy, we cry out to you on behalf of those that are sacrificing time and taking risk to care for our sick and needy. In your mercy, hear our prayers, we pray. 
Folks, I think you know the first five minutes every day is broadcast on UCB, so sometimes there's a little link or segue needed, but you know where I want to go today. Up on the screen in a moment is coming our prayer wall, and these are carers around the world, and I want us to stand together, literally to stand, if you would, and let's pray for our care workers, and let's really cry out to God for his protection, for his love, for his provision for each of these. And if you've got others, send them in to me. We'll add them to the prayer wall next week. Uh, I've said at the beginning of this broadcast, this is my favorite day of the week, and it really is, where we can get alongside and do more than just clapping, which here in the UK we do every Thursday evening at 8 p.m., but in Italy you sing, in other countries you have other ways of showing your appreciation. I saw some fire trucks in the U.S. doing like a drive-by in appreciation and it's touched our hearts that the caring profession is a vocation and it's sacrificial for many of the folks involved in it join join with me father we pray for elias for zoe in icu for melody for paul jr and annie a and e doctors we pray for emily another doctor for chairs a paramedic megan a nurse in oklahoma uh, lisa for jack for claire a community nurse. We pray for Anita. We pray for Terry. We pray for Amber and Victoria. Pray for Nate as he starts as a GP shortly in Gateshead. Sophie, a doctor. Another Sophie at Chelsea Westminster Hospital. Rebecca, a clinical nurse specialist. Asher in Ohio. Anne uh, in OT. We pray for Jeremy, for Lorraine, for Tim, for Joy, for Adam in Moorfields, for Victoria, for Kyra, for Jessica. We pray for Megan in Winchester. We pray for Anna. We pray for Jess. We pray for Becca. We pray for Jill, an A&E nurse, and for Barney and Josie, who are general practitioners, GPs. Father, in your mercy for each of those we've named and those that others right now watching this broadcast are naming, we lay them before you as those we appreciate, those we care about, those we are grateful for, as they take their frontline positions in this battle against COVID-19. Father, protect them, provide more than enough PPE equipment. We pray you would give them life and energy, stamina, endurance, and a spirit or an attitude that somehow finds room, space to allow the positive to increase, the negative to decrease, for faith to increase and fear to decrease. Strengthen each one of them, body, soul, and spirit, we pray right now. Amen. Now, it's my very big pleasure in a moment to be able to air a broadcast with Terry Waite. Before we do that, the interview with Terry Waite is in fact carried out by one of my closest friends. He's also a business associate and his name is Dave Rabetz. Many of you in the UK will know him, but it's my pleasure to start the rest of this program by interviewing my close friend, my business associate, Dave Rebetz. Well, folks, it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce one of my best friends, a business colleague, uh, and by the way, a joint vlogger. If any of you are into sailing, uh, Dave Rebetz, who you see on screen now, he and I run a video channel for sailors called uh, Lease Shores and Lazy Jack. So be sure to take a look at that if you're at all interested in sailing. But that's got nothing to do with today. Uh, Dave and I've worked together in all kinds of business settings. He's founding director of a wonderful company, global company called BCMS. But today, uh, two things we're going to chat about. Dave, I know shortly you're going to introduce Terry Waite to us and what a wonderful interview that is. But before we do that, I know from our chats over coffee and telephone calls during lockdown, you've got your own thoughts around what's happening to those of us with a faith during COVID and what an appropriate response could be. Could you share a bit with us around that? 
Well, I think where my mind's been going, Dave, um, rightly or wrongly, is it's a bit more philosophical, I suppose. I, this is clearly a painful and emotional issue for a lot of people. But philosophically, for me, it's not a problem. It's an emotional problem. It's a, a, a problem in numerous ways, but it isn't a philosophical problem. I, I, I actually feel that um, this is good for society. It's good for children not to be, uh, not to have it all, you know, and, and uh, young people maybe for the last generation or so have had everything. And uh, it's not a bad thing that we are, it's society some way having to recalibrate and uh, we, it's, it's causing us to re-evaluate what is worthwhile in life and what value is in our own lives. And uh, it's causing us to revalue the, 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 the value of a pound coin as well. And so in some ways, this is philosophically... Uh, now, I, I'm very cautious here. There's a lot of people that have lost loved ones and, and, uh, and there's some tragedy in all of this. But I'm just being philosophical now. So... Uh, part of me um, it, it embraces this, and uh, part of me is, um, you know, deeply concerned about all of the issues that it leaves us with. And it, it, I, I find myself a little bit torn. Uh, but it's so important in life, I think, to hold the good things that we have very lightly. And, and maybe this has, will teach us that a little bit more. I, I've rem I, I found myself going back to the book of Job. A lot. Oh no! <laughs> you too? Yeah. Oh, well, it's the book. I have some friends that are deeply afraid of that book. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. I can understand why, um, in some ways, but it does teach us that it's God's mercy that we have what we have, and not, it's not our right. You know, the fact that I've got a roof over my head and that uh, I've I've had a job for so many years. It's God's mercy and his kindness to us. It's not because I deserve it. I, I deserve quite the opposite. The fact that I, I'm going to have lunch in a little while with my wife, that, that food is God's mercy to us. And, and it, it's reminded me that how, how important it is to hold these things really uh, lightly in life. Jo Job said to his wife in, in a really intriguing uh, piece of dialogue, he said, look, we've received good things from his hands why shouldn't we receive occasionally bad things from his hands? In fact, he said, I, I, I came uh, from my mother's womb naked, and I'm going to leave this earth naked, and, uh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And, uh, I, you know, he's, he's given us, he gives us things, and occasionally he takes things away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I think, for me, it's just reminded me that in all of these things, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's not let that, let that slip. Brilliant. I'm going to open the door up here then, folks. If you'd like to challenge Dave Rebetz on this, or if you'd like to ask him some questions, I think I'd really like to have Dave back and give a whole interview over to this, because I think this is a fresh perspective for us. But Dave, um, by the way, folks, you know how to do that. Just davidoliverbooks.com, use the contact, or David O at insight-marketing, sending questions or thoughts around what Dave's just shared with us. But Dave, take us into the interview with Terry, because I know that's what folks are waiting for today. Uh, what an amazing opportunity. Just uh, take us in, would you? Well, sure. He, um, uh, Terry Waite was going to be a keynote speaker at one of our business events in Lambeth Palace later this year. Um, obviously, we've had to cancel that, but uh, uh, we were chatting and he... Uh, uh, was very happy just to give an interview a bit like uh, this that we're doing here and right now and so uh, uh, we took him up on that and he makes some really interesting points about his time in isolation. I, I was very very hesitant to talk about isolation because there is zero comparison uh, between what we're going through and what he went through but he talks about how he used anger uh, and I found that very interesting. And he talked about how you, you must use anger correctly, otherwise it will control you and it will take you over, but you, you need to tame it and use it. But it's a good thing to use occasionally. Um, he talked about how he was creative during this time of isolation and uh, occasional torture and uh, being locked up 23 hours and 50 minutes a day, chained to a, a stud in the floor. 
let out for 10 minutes a day to go to the bathroom. How can you be creative? He, talked about, he talks about controlling your imagination and uh, keeping a, a real tight rein on where you allow your mind to go, keeping your head in a good place. And he talks about uh, an awful lot more. So this is just a short 30-minute uh, interview that I did with him uh, uh, just a few days ago. And I hope it's uh, helpful to uh, people listening to this. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Dave. Let's have you back to talk about the other ingredients. But folks, right now, let's go into an interview with Dave Rebetz and Terry Waite. Terry, we're really grateful that you've taken some time to speak to us today. And you're actually, you're due to be one of our keynote speakers at uh, one of our London events later in the year. And I'm sorry that we've had to cancel that, at least for now. I think we were going to come to Lambeth Palace, which we were really looking forward to. But I think it's worth starting by saying that maybe there's a generation out there today that haven't heard your most incredible story. So would you mind if I asked you just to summarise what happened to you in the late 1980s that plunged you into the centre of world news at the time? Well, going back now, it's going back a long time, isn't it? It makes, you, makes me realise that I'm getting on in years. But... Um, in those days, in the 1980s, I was on the staff of Robert Runcie, Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, I'm not a clergyman, I'm a layman, and I've worked from a church base for most of my life. And my first major appointment was an advisor to the then Archbishop of Uganda, the first African Archbishop of Uganda. And uh, it was there that I really began my experience in negotiating mm -hmm. for people who had been illegally detained. And I negotiated directly with the men in those years. And it was in Uganda, I suppose, that I witnessed the most terrible uh, atrocities committed on innocent people. Uh, I actually saw people murdered before my eyes. And it was a, a very hard experience for a comparatively young man, I was in my 20s. Mm. Um, and uh, the church actually uh, played a, an extremely important role. Janani Lawum, who was Archbishop, continued to protest against the atrocities. He was murdered, in, wasn't he? He was murdered. Yeah. He was murdered. Um, and there was a memorial to him, actually, in Westminster Abbey. However, I went on and I worked in all the different, or most of the troubled spots of the world in negotiation and in um, reconciliation work. And then I was appointed by Robert Runcie to be um, his uh, um, assistant, really, uh, working. My prime responsibility was to travel with him and to uh, arrange his diplomatic and ecclesiastical exchanges and to be an aid to him in his travels and all his overseas work. And whenever overseas problems arose that concerned him, they came to my desk. And of course we had uh, then in the 80s um, a spate of hostage taking. Mm. And he knew that I had experience in this field. So the first, first successful one was Iran. Um, when I went to Iran and negotiated for the release of people. Secondly, in Libya, when you do it with Colonel Gaddafi, but when you do this type of work, you recognize that things can go wrong and you're never sanguine about it. And things did go wrong for me in Beirut. And to cut a long story short, I was captured and spent almost five years in very strict solitary confinement. Um, I was chained to the wall for 23 hours and 50 minutes a day. I slept on the floor. I had no natural light because I, if I was below ground, then obviously there's no natural light. If I was above ground in a bombed out building, then metal shutters were put in front of the window, so no natural light came in. I had no books and papers <clears throat> for over three, three years. I had one visit to the bathroom a day, and when anyone came in the cell, I had to pull a blindfold over my eyes so that I didn't see anybody. So it was... Um, a situation which is slightly more severe than lockdown at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Now, some people may wonder and say, well, what has that got to do with things today? It's so remote from 
what we're experiencing. It's so extreme. But I do believe that it's from extreme situations that we can take understandings that are applicable to so-called normal life, or as it is today, abnormal life a, a bit, but it's still fairly normal. We've still got our freedom, we still, to a limited degree, and we've still got our lives. Um, but uh, there are things that I could make parallels with, which, do, which um, are in fact, you know, related to today. Well, that's a bit of the background. You may want to ask more specifically something. I, I was not really intending to talk today about the issue of isolation because as I reread your story and your book over this uh, last week, and uh, most remarkable book, Taken on Trust, and it became very, very clear that this is incomparable. You know, we, as you say, we do have our freedom. We, we can walk outside. We can read our books. We can watch our televisions. We can see each other. Uh, so in so many ways, we've got our families around us. We've got the ability to exercise. All of the things that were taken away from you. I remember when they, reading about when they first put you back into chains after you'd been able to at least pad around the, the, the cell or the room for a, a little while and then you lost that freedom uh, how devastating these things were and there just isn't a comparison however something else that numerous people are facing today is perhaps a bit of a feeling of dread not to the same degree but that sort of uh, weight of will I have a job after all of this will my company survive yeah. this period will my sick family members pull through this and I'd love to hear how you managed that what for you was a daily weight that went on for nearly oh, 2,000 days of fear and uncertainty that you had to endure. How did you cope with that? Well, there were two, two things I could say about that. And that, this goes back right to the beginning of when I was first captured and recognized that I was a hostage and no longer a negotiator. <laughs> uh, my first feelings were feelings of anger. Um, and I was angry. I was angry with myself for taking such an extreme risk. I'd been invited to go and see someone who was about to die, or so I was told. And instead of allowing that, um, I was captured. But that's another story. So I was angry. And if you're angry, uh, you have to do something about it. Because anger does those who hold it more harm than it does those against whom it's held. And I, I, I've written a book um, some time ago called Out of the Silence, which is a book of poetry and reflection. And I looked at a little, very little verse about anger. It says, anger is like a consuming fire, seeking all whom it may devour. Do not extinguish the flames totally, but calm yourself by the gentle glow of the embers. In other words, say, you know, you allow it to get the better of you, it'll destroy you. But somehow, it's a force that's within us. We all have it. And there are times when we should use it uh, constructively, but constructively. Allow that force to be used constructively. And that's the way I began to take it. But the other one was rather more pertinent to today in some ways, the feeling of anxiety. Now, I was anxious, obviously. Uh, when that door in my cell opened, I didn't know whether they were going to come and, and kill me. I mean, I did go for a mock execution and I was actually um, beaten. Um, and those were hard experiences. So you, you lived every day on the edge, so to speak, with a high degree of anxiety. And then, of course, there was the anxiety about my family. I used to think to myself, oh, my goodness, uh, my children are going through education. Um, have I, by doing what I've done, have I put a stop to that? Uh, as it was, I underestimated the resilience of young people, the resilience of children. They have remarkable resilience, but I, I didn't think that at the time. And how would my wife be coping? How would she be managing? All these questions that came to mind. And the way to deal with it, or the way I dealt with it, and I suppose we'll all deal with it in different ways, is to say to yourself, 
first of all, remember you have life now. Today, you have life. Uh, not tomorrow. We yeah. live with an illusion, in a sense, when we're in a normal job, that everything is going to be fine tomorrow. Well, it may well be, but it's not at all certain. Uh, we've just got il certain illusions of certainty. When you're in that stark situation, you are faced with greater threats, of course. But you still have to say, now is the day. Now I'm going to live. And somehow, what I did was um, I had to concentrate on that and make the now as full as possible, even though I got limited circumstances. Now that meant. Um, with no physical exercise or very limited physical exercise, I could still have, I still had freedom. I still have freedom in the mind. And, you know, I believe that the brain, rather like a muscle, but unless you, if you don't use it, it dies on you. And so I began to write in my head. And that, of course, was, as you've already mentioned, the genesis, the beginning of the book Taken on Trust, which was written on put on paper many years later. So part of the answer is you will feel anxiety, but be calm and live now. And uh, that is one way of actually beginning to face the problem. Yes, I remember reading how you were quite deliberate about where you would let your mind go and you would often stop your mind going in certain directions quite deliberately. Again, quite important for today, I imagine. Well, you, you do have to uh, have a f certain form of, of discipline about that. I mean, I, in fact, this may sound callous, but it, it, it in fact, it was a, a mechanism designed to keep myself together. And that was, I had to put my family almost to the back of my mind and not think about them. Yeah. Because there was absolutely nothing I could do uh, to change their circumstances, nothing at all. Um, and so I had to do that. And that's another way of saying, well, we don't have to do that today, of course. But we can begin to put a certain discipline and say, look, I'm not going to constantly talk about and worry about what's coming up. Um, I'll make sensible provision. I may, and also recognize, there's another thing to say here, I think. Recognize that this is not necessarily a total crisis because out of every situation of this kind, something creative can emerge. And it's, a, I take, you could take this opportunity of lockdown as being a real opportunity for reflection, to be able to get to know yourself better. Now, um, I, I, did, I, I took that journey, that inner journey, to get to know myself better. Anybody who does that, um, with any degree of honesty, will discover, as they take that inner journey, the two sides of personality of character, the light and the dark, good and evil, call it what you will, which exists within all of us. And somehow, if you concentrate on the, the darker side, of, of, which is in all of us, everybody, nobody's lived, lived a perfect life, if we concentrate on that, we could be quickly led into depression and mental deterioration. Yeah. And somehow the way to deal with that is to begin to work for an inner wholeness, an integration. Uh, begin to try and, and find that within yourself, to recognize, look, I'm the same as every other human being, we're all made in the same way. Uh, but I'm not necessarily going to let the dark side overcome me. I'm going to try and work for that greater degree of harmony. And also you could discover, and many people have discovered this, I, I did myself, that I had abilities that I never knew I had. I mean, I'd never written a book before. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written what, about six or seven now, <laughs> you know, but, I'd never done that before. I never knew that I had that ability to use words and to write. Um, and that came up from captivity. And so I look back on it and I say, well, no, I wouldn't want to go through that again. And I sometimes say to myself, what did I get through five years like that? 
But then looking back on it, I say it was a most creative period. Interesting. And what you can say about today is, at the moment, it may look bleak and, and difficult, but there's a real possibility that you look back and you say, well, that was a life-changing experience for me. It taught me something about myself. It taught me something about my relationships. It taught me something about my relationship to the world, my attitudes to life, my attitudes to work, my goals in life. All those things mm. come from this experience. Very, very, very positive, very impressive, yeah. Now, many people will have to somewhat rebuild things after all this is over, particularly many business owners, private company owners. You've since been back to Beirut at least twice, I think, and I believe that you even offered to go to Iran to negotiate the release of British sailors being held hostage there. How did you prepare yourself to get back in the saddle? That must have been a difficult decision. Um, it, took, it took time before I could say. I mean, I think it's a question, it's a question of timing um, to know when you are ready for this. But I, I do not like, in my life, and I'm only speaking about myself at the moment, I don't like to leave matters unresolved, if I can put it like that, if I, if I can change it. And I do believe that one should try, as best one can, to take from situations which appear to be completely negative. I do think you should try and take something that, try and turn it to something positive. So I went back to Beirut and I, I went to meet uh, the group who, who were responsible for my captivity. Now, previously, I had been at night with a promise to go and see someone who was ill and dying, and it was broken. But I went back at night, and they were surprised to see me. <laughs> wow. And uh, I said, um, I, I, I sat down, and I said, look, we've been through very difficult times in the past. You have changed, I have changed. Um, can we take something creative from this experience? So they looked at me, and they said some rather complimentary things, which I won't repeat. And then he said, well, what can we do? And I said, uh, well, I've just come back from the Lebanese border. I've seen people who are ill and about to die and are fleeing from a persecution, they're hungry and cold. Can you let me have heating oil for them? He said, yes, we will do it. Now, it was a very small gesture. Very small, but I do believe if we as human beings can take the, uh, the viewpoint that we need to get alongside people, we need to try and understand why people behave as they behave. We don't condone the, the bad things that are done, but we always say they can be turned around. Something creative can emerge from them. And, you know, going on from that experience, at my 80th um, birthday, which was last year, um, believe it or not, the Lebanese ambassador in London put on a reception for me. Wow. Things have gone all the way around. Extraordinary. So, oh, I'm saying, now this is a long time, of course, it's 20 odd years ago, 30 years ago since I was captured. But what is time? Sure. Today you're heavily involved with uh, and, and act as a patron for quite a, uh, a few well-known and maybe a few less well-known charitable organizations. How are uh, you and the teams involved leading that, um, navigating your way through this period? Uh, with, with difficulty is the answer to that, because I think um, every charity, um, has difficulty at the moment. I, I just say a word, a, a background in that respect. Hmm. When I came out of captivity, I was, um, my job had been held open for me. And uh, I was invited to go back to Lambeth. And I said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Um, I now am going to earn my own living by writing and lecturing. I'm not going to take a salary. 
and I'm going to give my time to the charities that have always concerned me. And I'm not going to take money from them either. And I thought, well, okay, let's, let's give it a go. And I did. Um, and I haven't had a salary for 30 years. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been able to do it in my, in my way. And um, founded Hostage International, which is now working all over the world. We're working with hostage families to give them support and working with returning hostages. And that's um, something that's developed. With the Mayors for the Homeless, I um, helped start the Mayors in Cambridge 40 odd years ago, uh, certain, not 40 odd years ago, 25 years ago. And that now has, uh, one com it had one community in Cambridge when we started for 25 men and women. And now we have 40 communities Wonderful. across the country. Amazing. And then there's Y Care, which is uh, Y Care, which is for young people overseas who have limited limited opportunity for work, and uh, one has been associated with that. Uh, well, I have I founded that, co-founded that years ago. But we're all facing difficulties. But then everybody's facing difficulties. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to, for the moment, pull in the reins a bit, um, like everybody else. But we're not giving up. We're saying, right, we all we'll mark time a bit. But at the same time, um, the people who are really suffering at the moment are the people who always suffer in life, the very poor and the vulnerable. And somehow I think we have to make special effort yeah. uh, in our work to take care of the very poor and the vulnerable. Yeah, that's very good. You always seem to maintain an an aura of calm and I'm sure when you went through your hostage situation it was maybe more outward than inward but outwardly there was there seemed to be a calm and you kind of never lost that uh, sense of humor have you got any suggestions on, on how we can maintain that for some people who might struggle more than others <laughs> well I think Partly it's a matter of one's nature, one's temperament, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there was a funny story, in not many funny stories in captivity, but I used to plead with my guards to bring me books. And uh, they, they, they wouldn't for some reason or other. And one day I met a kindly guard. You always get someone in every organization who has a little bit of a heart. And he said, I'll try and get you a book. But he didn't know what, to, what he was going to get because he couldn't read English. And he couldn't be seen going to buy an English book. However, he managed to get one. And one day he came into the cell. Of course, I pulled the blind, pulled over my eyes, dropped the book by my side. And uh, when he went out of the cell, I picked the book up, looked at it and laughed out loud because unknown to himself, he brought me great escapes. <laughs> Stories of escape. <laughs> I didn't really. <laughs> Absolutely true story. I mean, no idea. But, <laughs> but the, uh, so, I mean, one had that sort of a laugh. But on, a, on a, just as another one more story, which I'd like to tell you, which I think relates to what we've been saying before. I had one visit to the bathroom a day. And as I went into that rather primitive bathroom, high up in the, this when I was on the third floor of an apartment block, High up on the wall was a window, and it was normally covered by uh, a metal, a uh, wooden shutter, padlock. And on one occasion I went in, and the padlock had been left loosened. So I clambered up there, there was no chance of getting through it, it was far too small. And the padlock had been loosened, so I climbed it up, and looked at the street below. And there, along the street, was walking a lady carrying a huge bunch of flowers. And they were really beautiful colors. The first time I'd seen color for years. And I said to myself, that rather trite saying, you know, the best things in life are free, really. Very interesting. It made me deepen my appreciation for that, you know, to be able to feel the wind on my face. 
eventually, to be able to feel the sun, to be able to be surrounded by so much of beauty, even though there is so much of despair and despondency around, to appreciate it and to recognize that perhaps, you know, as a species, we just all of us need to be in a better relationship with three areas, a better relationship with ourselves, a better relationship with our environment, a better relationship with each other. And some may say, well, what, what part did your faith play in this? I've never believed myself that if you have faith, you have special protection. I don't believe that. No. I believe that you, you take your chance along with everybody else. But yeah. I do believe um, I could say in the face of my captors, you have the power uh, to bend my mind and you cried because I was interrogated. You have the power to break my body and you cried because I was beaten. But my soul is not yours to possess. Now I have a great difficulty in defining what I mean by soul, but in that context I meant the whole person that I am. It will not be taken by you or anybody because it lies in the hand of God. Now, a very, very simple belief, I admit it, admit it, very simple, but enough to give me hope. And in this crisis, you know, which we're all facing in different degrees, if somehow we can find hope within ourselves, give each other hope, because that's important, to be able to give each other hope, um, we shall begin to come through this actually stronger and better very good yeah i I agree with you about um your faith shouldn't rescue you over others who don't have faith otherwise it would be religion for profit wouldn't it we'd all be being good for the wrong reasons and uh, that's not what faith is about at all but uh, i'm just i'll finish with one one thing that i recall from your book when you went into those pretty revolting toilets for that 10 minutes a day. On one occasion, you found a gun with a silencer attached. Now, that must have been a shock. Well, it was this. I I went in, took the blindfold off, and there was a gun. And, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you think so, a thousand thoughts go through your mind. And I looked at it, and I thought, what have you been saying? in all your negotiations, all your life, you've been saying to people who've done terrible things, when you're in a situation, don't use violence. Use your brain, try and find other ways. And you know, you have to be careful what you say because what you say has a way of coming back to you. And here it was coming back to me now. I was in a tight situation, faced with using violence. And I thought, no, if I now, do that, take that gun and use it, which I'll have to, then I've lost the last shred of integrity that I perhaps have. And pulled him back, he took it. Now looking back, of course you can say, was it a trick? Was he trying something on? Were they testing you? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it was genuinely a mistake. And I I don't regret doing that. Now, I must add a rider to that. I must say that don't anyone think who's watching this that I have behaved with exemplary way in an exemplary way all my life. I haven't. But I do think for all of us, there comes a time when you're faced with a critical point and you have to say, now, I have here really to stand on what I believe. Mm. Otherwise, lost it. And uh, I think that was probably one occasion for me. That defines integrity, doesn't it? Which I haven't always had. (laughs) (laughs) Terry, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it and uh, hope to see you in Lambeth Palace maybe uh, later in the year or sometime next year when things return to some normality, but we do appreciate you taking your time from your home in Suffolk to speak to us. Thank you so much. Well, can I just say to everybody, um, 
Thanks for listening. If you've listened this far, if you haven't gone to sleep. And the words are, I finished an article the other day, and then someone said, oh, you know, that reminds me of the words of an old hymn. And it was, um, dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways, and in deeper rest thy service find. Um, and how does it finish off? Drop thy still dews of quietness till all her striving cease. Take from our minds the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Mm. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. It's like finishing with a prayer. We appreciate it. Let's just assume that 50% of them were already working from home. They're already remote working. And now they're all probably working from home. Um, and then let's assume that when we come out the other end of this, and we will come out the other end of this, even if it is different, let's just assume that 50% of them actually go to their employers or their employers come to them and say, you can carry on working from home and we'll, we'll meet once a week or we'll meet once a month in a, in a serviced office and we'll still make sure we build culture and all those kinds of things as an organization. But nonetheless, work from your community. So what happens to the average person at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning they leave their home, they wander down the street, they buy a cup of coffee in the local patisserie, they're working from there. They then may, maybe they go and have their lunch in the pub. And then all of a sudden, there's an opportunity for that high street, which we are told is dying, is going away, to be rejuvenated, to be reinvigorated, to be relifed. And is there an incredible opportunity for small communities and towns? to actually be reinvigorated after something like this and for people to actually realize the value of community and relational buildings well, through that. You, you gave me just now a great example of someone who could reimagine their world. You had an estate agent knock on the door. Just share that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had an estate agent round and he's a local agent. They're a local business and obviously very, very concerned about what's going to happen in the next few months to them and uh, in the next few months for them. and we were talking about their role in the community. He knows his community really well. He, he knows the house we lived in. He knows most of the houses in the village that we live in. And I said to him, well, how about, rather than just be, being an estate agent, you use this opportunity to become a community agent or a community partner, uh, and you look to engage people with opportunities um, to flourish in the community. So you're, you're bringing businesses together. You're bringing people together. You're creating events and ways for people to re-engage when, when, uh, when we can do that in a, in a productive way. And I think it's that kind of thinking, that sort of redemptive thinking that we're going to need to need to be looking at as we move forward. And isn't that really sort of the nature of what happens out of chaos? You know, we have this incredible opportunity. God brings this incredible opportunity for us to see things in a redemptive way and so we just about that and he was really inspired by that and he was going to go away and talk to his marketing director about it and they were going to start thinking about putting a plan together about how they could be community partners i love it well keep us posted if if he does come back it'll be yeah. fascinating thanks for that, that paul